Hello and welcome to the GMBN Tech Show. On the show this week... A couple of great bikes, one from Commissar and the other from Ibis. Two new wheel sets from Nukeproof. And Vittoria finally break cover with their new trail and enduro tyre, the Mazza. And SRAM expands the Eagle range even further with the new GX. Okay, first up in news then is that new Common Cell Meta TR. Um, I've always been a huge fan of Common Cell, I've ridden many over the years. In fact, I've got a couple shoved up there somewhere, I think. Um, a couple of old frames are a bit battered, but I just couldn't get rid of them. Uh, old Meta 5.5 and one of them's a Meta 4, I believe. Um, I'll show them to you at some point. Anyway, back to this exciting new bike. Have a look at it on screen. This one's a real looker. Uh, 29 inch wheels, 140 mil travel out back, 150 or 160 on the front. Uh, it's got new kinematics on there. You've got more improvement room on the front triangle there for bigger water bottles and other storage, if that's your thing. And really, the geometry is the really cool thing about this. So, whereas before it wasn't exactly on the steep side at 66 and a half, it's now 64 and a half, so mega slack. Uh, a few more pictures running by you here. The seat angle is much steeper now. So it was 76.5, which is pretty good to be fair. Uh, it's now up to 78.6, so that's really steep. And of course you need that with the longer bikes to really return your weight to the middle of the bike. Optimum for climbing. It's got a shorter fork offset and it's also got a lower seat tube on it. So that's kind of handy because you could, I guess, size up on it if you wanted to, but what it does, it means you have more room for a bigger drop post in that bike. Kind of essential really with um, what you can do on the bikes these days. Now a few more shots are whizzing by you right now and you'll probably notice the fact that you can run it with a coil shock or an air shock. Now to try and describe what sort of bike it is, Commercial say, I quote them, it's uh, aimed as a mini enduro bike. Kind of makes sense, hasn't got the full feature travel that you'd expect on a 170, uh, maybe a 160 mil bike, so slight, slightly less travel but nonetheless no, no less fun, especially not with a coil shock on the back, I bet that thing rips. Kind of reminds me actually of what Commissar used to do with their uh, Mini Supreme and their Mini DH bikes. I used to love those. In fact, here's, here's an old retro shot of me on, uh, I think this is a Mini DH, orange one, and uh, I believe that's a Marzocchi 4, because it must have been taken on a Marzocchi product launch of some kind. Um, but awesome little bikes they were. And to a degree, they're kind of where modern Enduro bikes are now. Granted, that was 26 inch, but probably had six inch travel, maybe seven inch on the rear. But uh, yeah, very cool. So the frames are available in green or in high polished at 1,399 or 1,499 in euros. I've not got the US dollars yet. And models start at 2,199 for the base model and they go up to 499, um, 499. So pretty good selection and that's for the signature top of the line model. Um, looks awesome. What do you guys think? Comment sell, yay, nay? Also in the news, Nukeproof have brought not one, but two new wheel sets to the marketplace, the Horizon and the Neutron. So we'll start with the slightly higher end of the two, the Horizon. So at the hub, it uses 102 point engagement. And interestingly enough, it has some different pools and springs available aftermarket, should the stock tuneful noise be a bit too loud for you. Some people do like a quieter hub. I've never really heard of it before, but I think it's great to see somebody catering for those people. Now the Enduro bearings in the rim have a double lip seal. Basically what that means is it's gonna be better at keeping the external elements out, which will keep them running smoother for longer. So the rim itself uses a sleeved joint as opposed to a pinned or welded one. This basically means you can keep the rim into a better tolerance. And if you, know, if you ever built a wheel and it has especially a pinned rim, you can sometimes see them tick across and it's, it's a bit frustrating. So having a sleeve joint Nukeproof claim basically helps them build the wheel into the tight tolerances they want. The rim itself uses a magnesium and silicon blend. Now the theory behind this is that it's as stiff as a 7 series, but as workable as a 6 series, so it sounds pretty cool. Now the front and the rear wheels use the same rim profile, however the sidewall is slightly thicker on the rear because as you know when you're riding bikes and you hang up on something or you know, heavy compressions, that's where the rider's weight is. So it's often the place that gets dinged and battered about. That rim profile is using a 30 mil internal width and it comes taped and sealed front and rear with tubeless valves. The cost for the front is 150 pounds and the rear is 250. So as I said earlier on, it's not just the Horizon wheels, but also the Neutrons. So the Neutrons share a lot of the same tech as the Horizon, but a more affordable package. The front being 120 and the rear being 170. It uses a 29mm internal width, 36-point engagement and a 6-series alloy on the rim. 
but yeah, looks really cool. Good to see um, good to see more players in the wheel market for some uh, heavy duty wheels you can thrash about. Seems good to me. Our next up in news is the brand new Vittoria Mazza tyre. Uh, this is the bad boy in question. It is heavily focused to the trail and enduro market. It's available in 27.5 and 29 inch models and in two different casings as well. It's available in enduro casing, really tough uh, two ply casing there, and in the trail casing, which is quite a bit lighter to be fair. Now, the interesting thing is both those casings have a sidewall insert that both provides a bit of stability and uh, prevention against tearing the sidewalls with burping and things like that. And obviously it's just a bit more security. Now the tire itself features their unique four rubber compounds on there. Gives you nice supportive side lugs with a sticky rubber on the top and something a bit more supportive on the top for really driving the nobbles into the ground for that track seat you need. Now it's also got graphene in that rubber as well. Now we did report on this when we did a factory tour, I think it was about a year ago now, a bit longer maybe, lose track of it. But graphene is the wonder stuff and it's put in on a molecular level and it fills in the holes in the rubber essentially. So not only does it add cut resistance and durability, but also adds wet weather traction and reduces friction. Uh, pretty crazy stuff by all accounts. Now the tread design on it, I'm sure some of you would be like, oh, it looks like something I've already seen, but you think that the best things in cycling, all telescopic forks, they're all based on the same design. Four bar links, all based on the same design. There's a lot of similarities in bike design out there for good reason. Designers find something that works, they're like, right, we're gonna make our version, we're gonna make this as best as we can. And this is Victoria's aggressive tire. But the cool thing with this is it's suitable for use on the front and the rear, and that's thanks to the staircase. Now you might see this little staircase profile here on the main tread. Now, typically on the sort of aggressive tires, you'll see a ramp and the ramp will be there for a reason, it's to make the tire roll faster. If you've got big square lugs, like you see on the Vittoria Motor or on the Magic Mary, anything like that, they're gonna roll a bit slower because they've got squarer edges. The reason they roll slower is those edges create vibration, the vibration turns to friction and that is simply slower to ride. By putting a ramp on there, it does roll a bit quicker. So you get around some of the downsides of having a really aggressive tire. Um, but the downside with that, of course, is if you put that on the rear, you're not gonna get climbing traction. But Vittoria get around this by putting staircases on. So at speed, they perform like a ramp, but at low speed, i.e. climbing speed, it performs like a square edge tire. So really quite interesting tire technology in there. They've also got uh, progressive sipes on those shoulder lugs. The idea is it keeps it nice and stiff against cutting in basically. So you're cutting an edge, imagine like you're snowboarding, that sort of thing, you're really pushing it in. You don't want them to deform or fold over because you lose the point of having that, all that soft rubber. You've got the hard compound underneath, you've got the soft rubber on the top, and you've got the side pin there to keep it in place, but allow it to deform slightly over bumps. Whereas it goes the other way, is incredibly soft, thanks to that bigger progressive side there. Uh, really interesting stuff, and it means in theory, it should be really, really good over roots and over uneven terrain. Um, interesting stuff. Now you might also be pointing fingers saying, oh yeah, it's really similar to that DHF, you know, I've seen those out there. But you've got to take into account, this is a modern tire with modern casing, it's got loads of cool technology going on. The Minion, brilliant tire by all accounts. It's pretty old though. I think some of you might be quite shocked to find out it's like 18 or nearly 19 years old. Isn't that bonkers? Oh, there you go. That is uh, Victoria's new Mazda tire. Likey, no likey? Let us know in those comments underneath. And last Thursday, we saw the release of the much anticipated SRAM GX 10 to 52 tooth Eagle. So this is a 520% range cassette, which is massive. Now there is some small, but very important differences between the previous generation GX, but there's a lot of the same DNA running through. It still uses the same shifter, albeit with updated graphics, and the cranks have got a bit of a facelift and also, are now available in the Carbon 4 GX, which is pretty cool. So what's interesting is this is what they call their Expansion 52 cassette. So if you have this new generation, you can use the old 10 to 50 tooth cassette, but sadly, if you've got the previous generation, the current SRAM GX, you can't then add the new 10 to 52 tooth cassette because the new mech has a longer parallelogram. And that's an also, also comes with an updated spring rate in the rear mech, as well as more wrap, so more teeth are engaged. Now this should add up to better chain retention. 
So the pricing is pretty much the same right across the board and even the weights only change by a few grams. The new carbon cranks coming at 275 US dollars. The new generation, this new range is kind of built with an increase in range in mind, not necessarily a reduction in weight. Like I said, there's only a few grams here or there, but it's all about making usable gears. So theoretically, you could find yourself being able to run a bigger chain ring. Now, what advantages are there to that? Is it just so you can bomb down fire roads? Well, not really. It's also you, so you can change you know, the way the, the suspension and the drivetrain interact with one another, because as you go to a bigger chain ring, it reduces the value of anti-squat, which might be just what you're after to increase suspension performance on the sense. So there's a lot of clever thinking. It also comes in a whole host of colors to choose from, so you can choose your flavor depending on your local area to disguise the filth on your drivetrain. Okay, next up in news, an exciting one for me, is the Ibis Mojo, and it's the fourth version of it. Um, I love the Mojo. I had the Mojo HD, I had a Mojo HDR, um, which is, I think, the 650B model one, the first one that actually came with them rather than having the chip to make a previous model compatible. Um, beautiful looking bike, as you can see on screen. Now, this one's based completely around 27 and a half inch wheels. It's got 130 mil travel with their trademark DW Link out back. Now, they're definitely one of the companies that managed to use it the best because the fact it works so well on their bikes and it's got a real high amount of anti-squat especially in the lower gears which means it really stands up and goes up those climbs of course there's less anti-squat in the higher gears which is ideal because it means it's going to be a bit more comfortable you knock it down a cassette but what are you doing when you're down on the bottom of the cassette you're going faster aren't you so it gives you exactly what you want but it uses Igus bushings in the lower link and it uses uh, regular bearings in the upper link uh, good for a couple of reasons because those bushings in the lower link they're guaranteed for life um, also means if you had bearings in the low link we say I believe they used to on some of the older models uh, due to wet weather and stuff literally firing water down there it means you go through them a bit quicker so it's a more durable and it works better because that link moves in a different way that you would need for bearings now a few more shots on screen of the bike you can see here it's got plenty of mud clearance you can fit a 2.6 inch tire in there the frame weight is 5.9 pounds and that's with a dps shock on it so that's pretty impressive by all accounts for a pretty burly bike now you can fit large water bottles in there as always with ibis frames there's a couple of crazy colors available or at least crazy names uh, basically the blue and white the white is known as dirty whiteboard which i think is a really good name and the blue is blue dream uh, nice name it's also pork chop bag compatible i had to look up what a pork chop bag was uh, typically ibis don't do anything normal um part of, part of the charm behind the brand i guess uh, it's, it's essentially an onboard storage bag that you can fit in inner tube co2 cartridge multi-tools etc so you can plug one of those on the bike if storing stuff on the bike is your sort of thing and you can fit a full-size water bottle in it as well so happy days now it's four sizes from small through to extra large and the geometry on them now is really bang up to date i'm really really impressed with this so up front you've got 65.4 degree head angle you've got 76.6 degree seat angle which some of you might be going hmm, that's not that steep Remember at the beginning I said it's got a really high anti-squat value. So really your perceived seat angle is gonna be different because the fact wants to prop itself up when you're climbing, that is really when you need a steeper seat angle. So effectively has got one, so that's kind of cool. Uh, it's got 425 mil chain stay, so it's gonna be really punchy, just wants to live on the back wheel. And the reach goes from 440 up to 515 on that XL. Mega, I think that's great. Now the frames retail for 2,999 US dollars with a DPS shock. Complete builds are 4,499. Got a seven year frame warranty and a lifetime on the bushings. What more do you need to know? Gotta love Ibis. So last week we featured a glimpse of the new forks from EXT. Now it's very exciting, but details are very thin on the ground. So I thought I'd speak to Chris Porter at Mojo, who kind of worked very closely with EXT to try and get the inside scoop. So he says that they first rode the version of the fork in November and it has had production slots booked for a long time. However, because of Corona, it's really messed with that. But it uses progressive damping similar to the shocks and they're really adamant that this is the way to go. After months of the dyno, and he says literally months, they're pretty settled on, on a, most of the aspects, you know, in terms of the lowers, they think they're there or thereabouts. They might be still doing some things with the bushes. The crown, he says, might go for a major overhaul, but they've kind of got a working prototype. He also says that there's a real emphasis on using quite large pistons and a secondary piston for high speed. He says there's a range of adjustment that focuses on not just having as many knobs and twisters as you can, but having a usable range that really affects 
you know, affects how the shock operates, which is really, really important. So the air spring and the damper are still changing, but that's what they're testing for, just to try and settle and find out how those lab and dyno tests translate into the real world. So what's interesting is that this is still a single crown fork. We've seen Chris with the Mork system running, you know, more traditional downhill forks, even with a 36 diameter on his enduro bike. But he says to stay tuned because there could be something really exciting happening with the crown. So we'll just have to wait and see, but he was very guarded and wouldn't give me much details other than that. Although not a news piece, this is a little cheeky one as posted by Jesse Melamed on his Instagram page. Jesse, of course, is an awesome EWS racer. Look at the helmet he's wearing. I saw a lot of you, like myself, look at it thinking, hold on, he's sponsored by Smith, but it looks like it's a Troy Lee. It's not, it's a brand new Smith helmet. Uh, there are no details of this at the moment other than his caption. It's a mainline helmet and it looks sick. Look at this thing. What do you reckon? Do you reckon Smith have nailed it with his helmet? I reckon it has. And last up in news are three amazing cross-country biased products from Manitou. Um, I love this because Manitou were always one of the original bad boy companies in mountain biking. So chicken and egg really, what came first, Rock Sharks or the Manitou? They were both around at exactly the same time, the RS1 and the Manitou one. Um, you're talking a few days between them really, uh, but both of them are really amazing forks and they both really did put suspension for mountain biking on the map. Now this is the new R7 fork. Now the R7, uh, known as R because they have the reverse arch on them, they were really popular back in the day because they were extremely light and really easy to service. And I think that is where they're going with this. Now it's available in 27 half and 29 inch models in four different offsets. Uh, that is 37 and 44 and 44 and 51, depending off if you have the 27 half or the 29 inch model. Now it's available in 80 up to 120 more travel. So this, just to emphasize the point, this is an XC fork. And as you know, a lot of people are offering forks up to 120 mil now. The Fox 34 Stepcast and the Rockshox Sid Ultimate are two other contenders. But this one sticks on 32 mil stanchions. The Sid, of course, uses 35 mil stanchions and the Fox uses 34 mil stanchions. But Manitou say they don't need to jump up to 32s because that reverse arch and where the arch is positioned means the arch is shorter and therefore it's 13% stiffer than putting one on the front. So they can afford them to save the weight by not using 32 mil stanchions and they don't lose anything in terms of stiffness. Um, either way, it's a very lightweight fork or at least a claimed weight. Uh, you always have to take this with a pinch of salt because some manufacturers will cut them down and weigh them, some will weigh them uncut steerage tubes, but they say it's 1,648 gram in the 29 full travel 120 mil option, which is very, very light. Just to put it into perspective, the Fox 34 SC, the step cast model, they're around 1,670 grams. Um, again, whether that's an uncut steerage tube or not, you've got to leave that one to yourself. And the Sid Ultimate 120, although they claim it's a bit lighter on the site, I'd imagine it's shipped with a whopping great uh, steering tube on it. And I've seen a few people say that measures up at under 1,700, so 1,690. So it's definitely very competitive. Although it has got 32 mil stanchions over the 34 and the 35. Well, let's get to some of the other stuff on them. So here's a few more shots of them. So the air spring on the inside now uses the Dorado spring. So the Dorado was their old downhill fork. And it's got a positive and negative chamber. The negative charges itself when you inflate the fork. And it's also got a really cool system for adjusting the progression of the fork. And they call theirs IVA. That is an incremental volume adjustment system and it's self-contained spaces with five adjustable settings. So it's got a VTT damper on there and it's got three positions. It's got progressive, digressive, and locked out. Now, something that Manatee wanted to address was a lot of forks, when you have them fully locked out, it's quite often the mid setting can feel quite harsh and they wanted to avoid that. They wanted a full lockout on the max setting. The mid setting, it's got a bit of low speed on there, um, but as you'd imagine from the name, the digressive setting, it's actually gonna be a bit more comfy, but it's just gonna sit up a bit higher. And then the fully open or the progressive setting is a bit more comfortable. Uh, something you want that's gonna be a bit easier on your hands. But imagine being an XC racer, if you're looking at this fork, you're probably gonna be in that mid setting. Now it retails for 849 US dollars. Um, well, and this is it. I think it looks really cool. I was always a fan of Manitou. Um, I was always a fan of the reverse arch, if nothing else, because it looked really cool. And I always loved it when Pace, the British company, used to have the reverse arch. It was just, I mean, I guess it was a USP at, at the end of the day, but 
as they say, is 13% stiffer in their application, enabling them to have the slim line build. I think it's awesome as a cross country fork. So I guess the XC people out there could run even as low as 80 mil. You're gonna drop the weight down to maybe 1,500 grams. Uh, it looks amazing. And there's also a shock to go with it called the Mara. This is the shock on the screen. It weighs, uh, it weighs 275 grams, it retails for $424. It's got trunnion and eyelet mounts available, and it's got a twin circuit rebound. This is quite cool. So it's got basically low speed and high speed rebound. The low speed is via a needle that moves um, inside it, and then the high speed uses a shim stack. So of course, a low speed is to deal with rider weight and rider sort of movement on the bike, and high speed really is the one that you want to pay attention to making the adjustments, hence having the shim stack option. It sounds really cool, and it looks good as well. Uh, one last thing from Manitou, as I said, there were three things, is the return of the Answer Hyperlite handlebar. Oh man, so there was a Hyperlite and a Taperlite. Taperlite is what everyone got, because it's a bit cheaper and a bit more uh, everyday man's handlebar, but Hyperlite, that was the dreamy one that literally was Hyperlite. So it weighs 125 grams. Can you imagine a handlebar that weighs 125 grams? Not a lot, is it? Um, it comes in the team yellow or it comes in stealth color and it's available in 760 mil only. They don't do it wider than that. And it's also got a uh, clamp grit on the clamping areas and it retails for 174.99 uh, US dollars. Uh, it's really nice to see them back. What did you guys think of Manitou? Anyone got any perceptions? Because they're kind of, they've had mixed views over the last few years because they haven't really been around. But, but uh, yeah, what do you think of Manitou? Let us know underneath. Okay, now it's quiz time. I'm going to ask you three tech related questions, and hopefully, you're not going to Google this or uh, look on any other search engines, and you're going to dig into the brains that you've, uh, you've got. And hopefully, we've helped you gain knowledge from uh, listening to us on, this, on the channel, and you're going to give us some answers. First question, which German cycle brand that shares its name with a modeler car, there's a clue, makes bikes such as the Whistler, the Raven, and the Sam? Any clues? Maker car is really the, uh, the clue in that one. Okay, next up is a lot of modern suspension units involve an IFP. But what is it and what do the letters stand for? And finally, this is a really good question as I remember reading all about this. Which UK mountain bike brand found itself embroiled in a legal battle with a Formula One title sponsor and won it last year? Anyone? Now it is time for Bike Cave. This is the part of the show where we get to see where you work on your bikes, where you store your bikes. It's got everything from kind of cupboards under the stairs to full-blown workshops. If you have your own submission, get into the upload link below and hopefully we can feature it on the show. So the first submission this week comes from Dan in Cumbria. And he says actually, like a lot of people, he saw Blake's submission and thought, I've, I've got to get something done. And he's been trying to use his time wisely, splitting it between his current work. But I mean, it's pretty good. Quite a similar system to Blake. Blake's even said so himself, basically building all the bespoke cabinets to suit really. And it does look really, really, really tidy. I like the skirting board to hide that and seal it in entirely. And is that chopper on the old screen? I think it might be. Nice. Got his bikes hanging up and everything. Excellent. Nice. Next, we have one from Ben in Oxfordshire, and he says he's been planning for this a while to try and make working on his bikes a pleasure. He's moving into a new house, so he thought, well, this is my time. This is, this is when I can do it. And just looking at it, it looks pretty cool. Looks like he's got a wardrobe in there, which is actually a really useful thing. Just to have everything in one place. It's good to go. Got a very nice desk there, park tool stool, work stand, a few bikes kicking about. No, it looks very good. Very good indeed. Very tidy. I think um, my garage needs some like white walls and stuff because it's quite dim and dark in there. But you want something like this where Everything is bright and light and you know, it makes working and finding things you inevitably drop on the floor a lot easier. So now that looks great. I particularly like having that wardrobe in, in the bike cave. I think that's a really smart move. You've got loads of spare wheels and bags. I suppose, well, if you've got one of those, you know, like 
like Ben's done here. If you got one of those racks and yeah, don't include the, the boards, it makes a really good wheel rack, which is very, very nice. In the past, I've done it like securing one onto the ceiling and then having like the hanging gardens of Babylon, just loads of wheels. <laughs> I'm going to try and find a picture for that because I did it in a warehouse once for the old team. And yeah, I'm going to try and find a picture because it's pretty funny. But no, really, really good submission. Thanks for getting them in, guys. And if you've got your own submission, please get them into the uploader and hopefully we can have them on the show. Okay, now it's time for Rewind. This is where we go back in time to see where all the cool stuff we ride now came from. If you've got anything old, please take some pictures of it, uh, some video footage, any of that, and send it into that link that's on the screen there. And there's also a click through link in the description underneath this video. You can get involved in there. Now jumping straight in, I've opened this one up already and just seen this. This is mega cool. So this is from Scott um, from Washington, just outside Seattle. I've been over, overhauling a 1984 Nishiki road bike and I had to dip into the old tool section of the toolbox. I bought these around 1990 when I got serious about riding and wrenching. I can still reach for the old AWS one first, even though I have newer ones. Oh, I love it. Look at these. So you've got a headset of spanners there. Um, it looks like a cotter pin spanner. Mega cool. And then a crank puller as well. Wicked. And I like your caption. Only a rich man buys cheap tools. See? It's absolutely true, isn't it? If you buy them once, you don't need them again. You know, you don't need to keep replacing them. They're just there. They're always there when you need them. But I get it why people do, you know, struggle to lay out a lot of money for tools and just want to buy cheaper stuff. But it's going to cost you more in the long, in the long term. That's for sure. Wow, look at that old thing, a Bridgestone, with a Gervin flex stem on it as well. Wow. So this is uh, from Rob in San Francisco. It's a 1991 Bridgestone MB4. Now I have seen some Bridgestones, but I'm not really familiar with this. But it looks like it's got some really nice external butting on it. So let's get a bit closer. Hi guys, I finished my latest project. This was a freebie, perfectly my size. I've always wanted a Bridgestone with Richie tubing. There you go, that's, that explains the lugs on there. Uh, and components. Polished the silver, switched the drivetrain to Dior LX. Also had a flex stem laying around and a Julie Furtado cell saddle, as in Cell Italia. Uh, so I thought it'd go well on the bike. I kept the Richie wheels on. The uh, hookworm tires are just temporary until I come across something a bit more fitting. Let's look at some more close-ups. There's the flex stem. Ah, oh, great. So this is a pre-Gervin flex stem. So um, it was Bob Gervin that designed the flex stem, but the company he designed it for was off-road bikes. So their early suspension bikes, like the uh, 55, uh, 550, 956, all those bikes, they had rear suspension and they had a flex stem on the front that didn't have a fork. And this is one of the steel ones. So I have a later model, which was a Gervin flex stem, and it has an alloy quill on it. Now, alloy quill one weighed a load, so I tried to think how much the, the earlier steel ones weighed, but that is legit. That is one of the original ones. Now, if you look close, you can see the Richie uh, top cap or the top nut on the headset. Just above that, and you see under the little yellow wing there, you can see a bit of green. That's the elastomer rubber. That is the suspension unit on the flex stem. It literally pivot, pivoted and squashed an elastomer rubber bumper. I used to get them in blue green, red, and black, I think. I think black was the heaviest. Uh, I forget the rest of the order, but um, that's wicked to see. That's ace. And there's the Juliana Furtado saddle. Oh, man. So, you know, uh, Juliana Bikes was named after Julie Furtado. What a legend. And, of course, we had the uh, the GT suspension series recently on Rewind, and she was on the RTS one with that crud catcher on that she won the World Championships on at Bromont in 92 on the first time she rode the bike. She was a legend. Still is a legend. Awesome. Really cool. Uh, yeah, and the original Richie wheels. There we go. Richie Logic Super Tubing by Tange. Beautiful. Lovely looking frame. Okay, next one um, is from Andy. Uh, it says and Andy owns a Pace RD100, but the picture is not of that. It's of uh, Deb Morell's Formula One downhill bike. Now, I remember this clearly from MBUK Magazine way back before I used to work for them. Now, note the fork on it is straight up. This, will, this is a weird one. So it's a RockShox Mag 21 and it had the lowers flipped backwards. Uh, so she's got a brake on the rear. I don't know why that was done. I can only think it was done aesthetically because it did look really trick. And Pace forks at the time were arguably one of the coolest and they had that reverse arch on them. Now the full suspension model of this, I believe this might have been her downhill bike because she used to race cross country for them. Um, I used to see the cross country one quite a lot, but I'd never actually seen a full suspension one. But look how tiny that shock is. I can't have had much travel 
on there. And I think Deb, you know, she was uh, she was tiny, really, so you can see that by the size of the bike. That's a 26 inch wheel bike, and look how low the saddle is. So really small. Not really seen anything about those, but yeah, um, you say, does anyone remember them? They were always a dream bike. 100% agree with you. In fact, I watched something the other day that someone cheeky has uploaded onto YouTube, so you can look for it. Look for a film called Totally Wild. It's an early 90s mountain bike film, and um, Jamie Tatlow, her teammate, is in it on one of those. Now, it's a, it's a really, really cool old film. I mean, it's appalling the way it's put together, but there's some classic riders in there. Jez Avery's in there, Scott Domit. Um, as I say, Jamie Tatlow's in there. Jay Hardy, he's one of the organizers by Norman Hills Classic. He's in there riding. And Rob Warner makes an appearance as well. Uh, and Dave Hemming as well. So that's definitely a cool old school film. It's basically a bunch of guys doing skids and wheelies in a car park. That's all it is, but it's so old, it's kind of terribly brilliant. Uh, check it out. There's going to be a link to it. In fact, underneath here, for all you naughty people that want to watch that naughty video that's up there. Uh, what else have we got? Wow, look at that mongoose. Oh, look at this. So I remember these. In fact, hold on a second. I can do better than I remember one because I've got a jersey in this. If I just reach behind here, delve into my bag of jerseys that I've got. Bear with me a second. I'm still, I'm still delving. I'm still going in there. And there's Rob Warner's one, don't want that one. Uh, Steve Gills, don't want that one. Steve Pete's jersey that was cut off him, no, we don't want that one either. Oh, that's my little t-shirt. Covered in signatures, no, we don't want that one either. It's not the one I'm looking for. Where is it? There we go. Now this is the jersey that matches the bike. I've got so much random stuff. This is a Mongoose Brian Lopes jersey. And it matches that exact bike. That's the bike he used to ride wearing one of these jerseys. Um, how cool is that? It's actually really cool. I might wear that at some point, if it fits me. Brian's quite small, isn't he? I mean, he's quite stacked, but he's only little. Um, whereas I'm quite lanky. But back to the bike, look at this bad boy. It's got a set of uh, Hainbrink forks on there. So Dan Hainbrink designed those. Um, what else have you got to say about it? And what's your name? Mike, it's a 1998 Mongoose NX 9.7. Good day, GMBN Tech. This is a mongoose I thought I would share with you. It's had some additions made on it, but I was hoping you could tell me a bit more about it. A friend of mine's storing it uh, for a relative of his, and we were wondering about the history. Well, the fork on it, so that was designed by Dan Hainbrick. Um, he had several forks out. That was the inverted one. That was the real heavy duty one. It had eight inches of travel, uh, coil spring, as far as I remember. And they made a cheaper fork for the masses called the Zykes or the Zyzix. I forget how you pronounce it. And that was the correct way up or the wrong way up if you were into motorbikes. Uh, the Zyx fork, in fact, they were awful. I had a set for probably three weeks and I cracked the crowns on them. Um, but, that, but that was the legit high spec one. Um, it's a single pivot bike, as you can see, an awful seat post on there by Titec and a uh, Zonic love seat on there. There was an obsession with having massive saddles back in those days. But look at that direct mount stem. Kind of reminds me of like the forward geometry that Mondrake had brought in. And then you've got IRC tires on there. They could be missiles or Cujo's. I can't quite see the tread from this angle. Uh, you've got sun ring laid double wide rims as well. Awesome. Answer Pro Taper bars. RockShox Super Deluxe Shock. Uh, you've also got a Hayes HFX mag on there on the left hand side. Yeah, there's that Azonic Love Seat again. Uh, Zonic pedals, closer detailing of that super deluxe shock. Man, Rock Shock's been making rear shocks for a long time, eh? Yeah, look at those pedals. I had a set of those, they were really good. It's a good bike, actually. Mongoose, would, they used to do a lot in those days. I can't tell you too much more other than that, to be honest. A um, bit about the kit on there. Single pivot bike, funky looking thing. All I remember was when Lopes used to ride from, he did ride those, but he also used to ride a lot of intense frames badged up as Mongoose. I think they've had like, a, over the years, a bit of an identity crisis. I mean, they make some excellent bikes, to be honest. Um, obviously they came from the BMX world, that's where their real heritage was. But in the mountain biking, they've gone, they've gone up and down over the years, but they've always managed to have some very cool bikes out there. I know the last few years been over at Sea Otter, it's like the brand's come back to life again. So kind of interesting to see where they go with that, actually. But, um, but the old DH, don't know too much about it. If anyone does, I'd love to know a bit more about it myself. So get in touch in those comments if you do. But uh, yeah, wicked, really cool to see. Random today, very random. Sorry about that. I'm not that sorry, I enjoyed it. I forgot I had that jersey, kind of cool. Here it is again, one more time. <laughs> So 
So now it is time for the tech quiz answers. So the first question, which bike brand shared its name with a model of car and it is Focus. So the interesting story behind Focus, or this is kind of what they say, is that it was started I think in 1992 predominantly as a cyclocross brand and they trademarked the name Focus, not really thinking anything of it. However, I think it was kind of Eurocar like 2000 and a well-known company called Ford released a car called the Focus and they came to a settlement that was, you know, like, I don't know, say 10 quid a car. But they made like 10 million of those things. And apparently the rumor is it was that substantial amount of money, however much it was, I'm just speculating, that really helped kick the brand into the next gear from going from small boutique cyclocross brand to sponsoring world tour teams, you know, enduro bikes, you know, everything. So I, I'm pretty, I've, I've got a feeling there's quite a lot of truth in that because I've heard it from a reasonably reliable source. The second question, what does IFP stand for? It stands for internal floating piston. So this is to regulate the expansion that goes on when you plunge a piston through the oil. So you might have seen bladder systems that obviously swell up for the expansion. An internal floating piston is basically pressurized via a steel spring or air, and that basically works itself, you know, and it kind of ups and downs. So you might see that in a cartridge in a fork or similarly in the piggyback reservoir that's where the IFP is on, um, on a rear shock and the last question it was of course white bikes who took on rich energy the sponsor of Haas Formula One team and won now I'm no legal expert but I mean come on they were kind of similar it has to be said though I don't know if that puts me in some you know legal hot water or not but either way that's just how it is white bikes were the victors thank you very much for watching don't forget to like and subscribe and we'll see you next time cheers guys